الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. So as we do um, every Friday afternoon, inshallah ta'ala, um, we're going to have a lecture tonight. And since we are on basically on the cusp of uh, the month of Ramadan, the blessed month of Ramadan, um, and the month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an, I thought it would be appropriate that we <clears throat> take the time out to start beginning to reflect on some of the ayats in the Qur'an. Um, there are many profound verses in the Qur'an that describe various scenes from the hereafter. And there is a particular passage, a particular collection of ayats that I want to focus on tonight. And the reason why I want to, you know, kind of focus on some ayahs from the Qur'an because, <clears throat> number one, uh, Ramadan is approaching and you find many of the believers are scrambling trying to get their souls in order. Ramadan is upon us and you'll find many scrambling right now trying to get their affairs in order, trying to get their souls right trying to, sisters are making up days that they miss from the last Ramadan. Brothers are beginning to, you know, lessen, you know, some of the sins and things that they were, attachments that they had to people, vices, devices um, that had pulled them away since the last Ramadan, away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the, the most one of the, the, the things that helps to get the soul right is to contemplate and reflect on death. The Prophet Wasallam told us uh, to remember death often. For indeed, remembering death, يُذَكِّرُكُمْ akhira, That it reminds you of the hereafter. Alright? So, what we're going to do tonight, inshallah, is take um, a set, a group of ayats from the Qur'an and contemplate on those ayats because they concentrate on um, our departure from this world. We know that at some point in our lives, you know, this human existence that we're having, this human experience that we're having is going to come to an end. Um, and bearing that in mind, we know that there's um, a certain set of um, obstacles and things that and challenges that we have to experience upon our departure from this world. So we want to take a look at some of that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and these ayats, these are the last ayats from Surah to Zumar. Surah to Zumar, um, Surah number 39 in the Quran. Um, very beautiful surah. But the last Five or six ayats from that surah are by far some of the most profound, some of the most impactful verses that you could read to get your heart, to get your soul back in order. And the recitation of those ayats um, by um, a reciter by the name of Khalid al-Jalil. Khalid al-Jalil. If you go to YouTube and you type on YouTube, recitation of Khalid al Jalil, Surah to Zumar, you'll find that recitation come up. I guarantee you that if you've never heard Khalid al Jalil recite these ayats before, you are going to cry when you hear him recite these ayats. I kid you not. You're going to cry when you hear him recite these ayats. So these are some of the ayats that we want to look at. Now, in preparation for Ramadan and getting our hearts right, getting our souls right, and getting our lives right in preparation for this transition from this life to the next. So, proper preparation prevents poor performance. One of the most powerful passages in the Quran that captures the two extremes that Muslims should live their lives in between, and that is fear and hope. 
Al-Khawf wa Raja, fear and hope, every Muslim should live their entire lives in between these two extremes. In between the extreme fear and hope. And we are right in the middle of those two. Between fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept anything from you. No one is guaranteed that Allah has accepted anything from you. We supplicate, we make dua. Allahumma taqabbal minna innaka anta samiu al-alim. Wa tuba alayna innaka anta tawab al-rahim. Oh Allah, accept from me. Accept from me my deeds. Taqabbal minni. Accept from me my deeds. Innaka anta samiu al-alim. For indeed you are the all-hearer, the all-knowledgeable. Wa tuba alayya innaka anta tawab al-rahim. And turn to me and accept my repentance. For you are a tawab the off returning Ar Rahim, the most merciful. So as Muslims we live our lives in between these two extremes of fear and uh, of hope. And both of these two, fear and hope, are motivating factors that fuel our drive to endure the challenges that we face in life. Fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to accept anything from me and hope that Allah will have mercy upon us and despite our shortcomings, despite, you know, the fact that we did not live up to our true potential, right? Because there's no Muslim that could be honest with him or herself and say that you are living up to your true potential as a Muslim. We're not. None of us. All right? But we live in between fear and hope, both of which are motivating factors that fuels our drive to endure the challenges that we face in this life. These verses in Surah of Zumar, they concentrate on this very thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the passage with, وَنُفِخَ فِي السُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامٌ يَنْظُرُونَ Allah says, and وَنُفِخَ فِي السُّورِ And the trumpet will be blown. The trumpet will be blown. فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ And everything and everyone on the face of the earth that anyone that is in the heavens and in earth, on earth, will perish. Everything. And this is a loud, excruciating sound that when we hear this sound, anyone living on earth during that time is going to automatically know what that sound represents. And the pregnant mother, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, that the pregnant mother will drop her load. All right? The pregnant mother will drop her load. وَتَذْهَبَ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ أَمَّنْ عَرْضَعَتْ وَتَذَعُ كُلَّ حَمْلٍ حَمْلَحَ وَتَرَى النَّاسَ السُّكَارَ وَهْمَاهُمْ بِسُكَارَ وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٍ that you will see people the the um, on a day when the pregnant mother will deliver her load, whether the child or the fetus is completed or not, if it has completed its term or not. The pregnant mother, upon hearing this excruciating sound, tabaa that hamlin hamlaha, the pregnant woman will drop her load immediately will drop her load immediately because the human being at that time will be all for self. No one will want anything, right, to do with anyone or anyone. Everyone will be focused completely on themselves. It will be complete selfishness at that moment. You don't want anything to do with anybody, right? Allah mentions in another ayah, that the day when the uh, man will flee, يَوْمَ يَفِرْءُ مَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي That a day, the day when a man will flee from his own parents, 
We talked about the pregnant mother delivering her load. The pregnant woman will deliver her load, whether it is finished or unfinished. She's going to push it out. And that shows you that mercy will be removed at that point. Because when, we're, when you're dealing with selfishness, when a person is selfish, they don't understand mercy. When a person is selfish, they don't understand mercy. When a woman is pregnant, she's in fear that the child is going to be premature, going to come out before it is time. So she's eating healthy, right? She's, you know, doing things to protect the child from, you know, a pre, you know, delivery. All right? From being prematurely delivered or prematurely, you know, um, uh, exiting the womb. Right? Women do things to protect that. All right? Because there's mercy involved. You understand? There's mercy involved. But when you hear this excruciating sound, an immediate, an immediate self, selfishness will overcome, right, creation that a pregnant woman will push her load out. Can you imagine that? The pregnant woman will push her load out whether it is finished or unfinished. Unse you understand? That people will be so selfish, mercy will no longer be a factor. This is what these ayats are referring to. The absence of mercy. The absence of mercy. Because when people are selfish, they don't care about anyone except themselves. Mercy, whenever you have selfishness, the absence of mercy is there. It's, or there's no mercy. So the woman, pregnant woman, will drop her load, push her load out, and on a day when a brother will flee away from his own biological brother. And flee away from his mother and his father. No mercy. What nothing to do with his mother or father. And he will run away from his companions, his friends... And even his own children. Even his own children. Then Allah says in another ayat, in the very next ayat, لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِي Because every soul on that day will have enough to worry about than to be worrying about someone else. Selfishness. And we talked about this in the khutbah, that our religion carves out a small space for you as a Muslim to be selfish. But we're constantly making sure everybody else is happy, everybody else is taken care of at the expense of our own happiness. And then we confine ourselves to a lifetime of misery. Nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ الله. That the trumpet will be blown, and everyone on the earth, everyone in the heavens, will perish, will fall unconscious, will perish, except those whom Allah wills. ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامٌ يَنْظُرُونَ Then the trumpet will be blown. Trumpet will be blown for the second time, and everyone will be standing, looking around. For either whom qiyamu yandurun, everybody standing around, looking around, seeing if they can identify. We're in a new place, right? You know, to wake up in a new place um, can be very traumatizing, even in this life, right? You ever move into a new home? And you sleep there the first night and you wake up the very next morning and you're looking around because what you're seeing is not familiar. You may have been living in your previous place for, you know, a year, two years, 10 years, 15 years you lived in a home. And then you relocate to another place and then you wake up the very next morning. You know, it takes you a while to focus because this is unfamiliar territory. You're not familiar with this. And sometimes it can create anxiety, even within children. When a child goes to a new school, 
or a child goes to school for the first time, children experience anxiety. You take the child to school, the child is kicking and screaming, the child doesn't want to go, there's a new teacher, unfamiliar faces, new environment, especially if the child was homeschooled or the child was at home for the first four years of the child's life, all they know is home. And then out of nowhere, we stop that and then put them into a school. It can be traumatizing to a child. It is traumatizing, right? You think about, um, you know, marriage, the, the very next day after you're married, right? It can be traumatizing. It can be traumatizing for both men and women. And this is especially true for men that are in polygyny. For men that are in polygyny who have multiple wives, when you marry your next wife, you marry your second wife or third wife or whatever number, whatever category she falls into, if you've been with one wife or two wives for a substantial amount of time, right? This is something, this is a part of polygyny that, you know, you don't really hear about, right? This is, these are the intricacies of polygyny that men don't usually talk about. They don't, they don't really understand. They don't know how to articulate it, right? You've been with a woman or multiple women for a substantial amount of time. Let's say you've been married to your first wife for 10, 15 years, and then you marry another wife. Or you've been married to two wives for, you know, 10 years, and then you decide to marry another wife. When you marry that woman, it's, it's all good. The very next morning or mornings after you wake up in that new situation, some of us, we experience what is called separation anxiety. Yes, men experience separation anxiety. You wake up in the home of another woman or in another home that, you know, you got together with a new face, new environment, new energy, all of that. And in waking up, Right, Men pride themselves on having another wife or having another situation, but what you're not thinking about is the separation anxiety that you are going to experience maybe a week or two weeks or three weeks or six weeks after you've been married to this new person. And you are going to look at this person and say, who did I marry? I want to go back home. I want to go back and be with the person that I'm familiar with. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've talked to many brothers in polygyny who have experienced the same thing. And although at the time they didn't know what it was, they didn't know how to articulate what it was, when I brought it to their attention that it was separation anxiety, they were like, wow, that's exactly what it was. And even women, they experienced the same thing. You were raised in a house with your parents. Raised in a house with your parents. And then you have a couple of sit-downs with this brother, and then you marry this brother. And although you're comfortable, you're in this environment, it's still new. So you wake up, you're no longer in the bed that your parents bought for you. You're no longer in the home that your parents raised you in. You're now in the home of a complete stranger. You're in the home of a complete stranger. And this is especially true if you've only had two or three sit-downs with the person. <laughs> The person is literally a legal stranger. <laughs> it's, it's halal for you to be with them, but in, the fact of the matter is that you're a complete stranger. And that can create anxiety. Many women have experienced anxiety. you separated from your parents. You're separated from your bed that you are familiar with, the home, the environment that you are familiar with, and now you are in a new environment. Right? So when you think about that, and the anxiety and the trauma that you are experiencing being in this new environment. Think about what is going to happen to you at the time when your soul is departing from your body. And you wake up and you're now in the grave. Can you imagine? You were just living on earth in this physical body. Right? You were just living on earth in this physical body, having a physical, totally physical experience. You experience all of the you know, emotions that come with this physical body that our souls are inhabiting. Inhabiting, right? All of the emotions that are connected to this body that our souls are inhabiting, right? And then you wake up 
And now you're in a grave, a box. You're six feet under the ground. You can hear footsteps above you. You can hear people talking, but you can't respond. You can hear people mentioning your name as your janazah is going on, as your funeral is going on. You can feel people pushing right, the, the box with your body in it, pushing it and putting it into a, a, a car and driving off and going into the grave site. And you can hear the screams of other souls being tortured in the graveyard, the same graveyard that you are about to be put into. Right? Brand new environment. Talk about separation anxiety. Separation anxiety. So then on top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامُ وَيَنْظُرُونَ Then the trumpet will be blown again and everyone will be brought back to life standing around, looking around at each other. يَنْظُرُونَ New environment. And at that point, reality sets in that I'm here for judgment. I am about to have my judgment. And all of the, you know, reality, you know, you know, all of the, the, the reality that we ignored, we knew was there, but we ignored, will now be staring you right in your face. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in another ayat in the Qur'an, وَيَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي السُّورِ فَفَزِعَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ وَكُلٌّ أَتَوْهُ دَاخِرِينَ وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدًا وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ صُلُّ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَفْعَلُونَ مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ فَلَهُ خَيْرٌ مِنْهَا وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزِعِ يَوْمَئِذٍ آمِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayat in the Qur'an, talking about the blowing of the trumpet again, and on the day when the trumpet will be blown, فَفَزِعَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ And then there will be terror in the hearts of everyone in the heavens and in the earth, except those whom Allah wills. And everyone will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, everyone will succumb to the blowing of this trumpet. Everyone will succumb to the blowing of this trumpet. And you will see the mountains thinking that they are strong and put into their position. Put into you look at the mountains, they look tall and strong. But those mountains, Allah says, "Tamuru marra sahab." These mountains will float away, like the floating of a cloud. This is the sunnah. Uh, this is the deed. These are the actions of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, which He has perfected each and every one of them. And indeed, He is all aware of what you do. And whoever comes on that day with hasanat, with good deeds, then He will be rewarded for the best of them. وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزِئِ يَوْمَئِذٍ آمِنُونَ And those who did good deeds, they will be protected and secure from the terror that others will experience on that day. The blowing of the trumpet, brothers and sisters, will reveal the true nature of the world that we live in. The world that we fell so in love with. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُسْتَخْلِفَكُمْ فِيهَا الْدُنْيَا حُلْوٌ مُنْخَدِرًا That the dunya, this world, is sweet and green. حُلْوٌ مُنْخَدِرًا It is sweet and green. وَاللَّهُ مُسْتَخْلِفَكُمْ فِيهَا لِيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah put you in the earth to see how you were going to act. فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاء So fear the world. Fear the world. Be aware of the reality of this world. It's green and it's sweet. But be aware of this world. It's very dangerous. 
There were scholars who had renounced the world. There are people today who have renounced the world, want nothing to do with all of the technology, the advancements in technology and science and all of these modern devices that we have in our homes that are basically, we're walking around with cell phones is like walking around with a microwave in your pocket. You're walking around with all types of radiation flowing through your body, flowing through your home. This Wi-Fi, these signals, right? We're not aware of how these signals, how these frequencies, how they mess with our makeup, how they mess with the natural fabric that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We're not aware of how these things continue to disrupt our normal frequency. Even listening to music at a certain frequency, when you, for those of you who listen to music, and you turn your music up to a certain frequency, that frequency can begin to interfere, right, with your normal human frequency. Understand the energies and the, you know, that are around you. Very important, man. Very important to be aware of this stuff, man. Nonetheless, the blowing of the trumpet will reveal the true reality, the true nature of the world that we fell so deeply in love with. It will transform everything that was hidden into an apparent reality. The veil of the physical world will be removed. And once everyone is brought back to life, we will recognize one another from our relationships and our interactions with one another in this life. We will see a whole completely different world once that, I mean, even, even when one of us departs from this world, even when you die and your soul leaves your body and you depart from this world, your human experience is over with, you will now see the world as a different reality. You will see the world as a different reality, no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to wait until you die. Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored to be awoke, favored to be awoke. There are some people who are awoke. We use that word, you know, very randomly. We use that word with really not understanding the implications of, of that word. You say, I'm, I'm awake, right? I'm awake, right? There are some people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes the veil from their eyes and they can actually see the world for what it is. They can see people for who they are, right? Allah has removed the veil from them. You don't even have to wait until you die. There's some people who have been afforded that, that luxury, all right? And it's not actually a luxury. It's actually a punishment. It's a punishment to be woke, man, because you look awkward to everybody else because you can see things from a place where other people can't see However, we will recognize one another from the interactions that we had with one another, the relationships that we had in this life. But the manner in which we will be standing next to one another will garner fear and anxiety and worry, the like of which we have never experienced before. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or she said, Sami'tu Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqool, يُحْشَرَ النَّاسِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ حُفَاتٍ أُرَاتٍ غُرَلَةٍ Aisha said, I heard the Prophet wasallam say that people will be gathered on the day of judgment. They will be naked, uncircumcised, and barefoot. So Aisha, she said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ الرِّجَالُ وَالنِّسَاءِ جَمِيعًا يَنْظُرُ بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ Aisha said, oh messenger of Allah, are you telling me that men and women will be naked, standing next to one another, looking at one another? Aisha couldn't fathom this because in their society, in that environment, modesty, modesty um, was at an all-time high, right? Even Aisha said that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and her father, Abu Bakr, were buried next to each other in her room, in the house where the Prophet ﷺ died at. The Prophet died in Aisha's house, right? Aisha said when her father was buried there, she said she used to go into the room where they were buried, and she would not wear her hijab because the Prophet was her husband and Abu Bakr was her father. So she didn't wear her hijab. 
She said later on, when Umar was buried next to them, she said, Wallahi, I never went in that room again. I never went in that room again, except that I had on my hijab. Mutahajjibah min shatni Umar, min makan Umar. I used to, I never went back in that room again, except that I had on my hijab because of Umar. Umar was buried there. This is a level of modesty that many of us can't even fathom today. That here is a woman who was modest and shy in front of a man who was already deceased. A man who was already dead. But she was too shy. She was too modest to go in a room where he was buried without her hijab on. So Aisha couldn't fathom the scene that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was, you know, drawing for her. He said that people will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment, men and women standing next to each other, completely naked, uncircumcised, barefoot. And somebody might say, well, why is that? <laughs> because that's the way that Allah created us. That's the way we came into the world. That's our origin, <laughs> right? You were uncircumcised, you were barefoot, and you were naked. You had no clothes on, you were naked. And you are uncircumcised. That's exactly how you came into the world. And as Allah says in the Quran, "Kama badatna awwal khalqin nu'idu." And just as we created the first of creation, so shall we return you back. Meaning, when we return to Allah on the day of judgment, we will return back to God in the same form, in the same fashion in which we entered into the world. Right? When we came into this world, this is how we were. And so when we return back to Allah, that's exactly how we will return back to Him. So Aisha said, are you saying that men and women will be naked and uncircumcised and you know, barefoot staring at one another? And the Prophet wasallam said to Aisha, he said, Ya Aisha, Al-amru ashaddu min an yahummahum dhalik. He said, oh Aisha, the the scene will be more scary, will be more traumatizing than for anyone to be worried about whether or not the person has on clothes or not. It will be more traumatizing, more scary than for anyone to be concerned with the fact that this person doesn't have on clothes. He said, yeah, Aisha, الأمر أشد من أن يهمهم ذلك. He said the that situation would be far more scary, far more traumatizing and traumatic than for anybody to be worried about that. He said الأمر أهم من أن ينظر بعضهم إلى بعض. He said the affair will be so much more important. They will have so many more important things to worry about than to look at the fact that this person doesn't have on clothes. So once that trumpet is blown and people are standing in front of each other, there will be no familial relationships whatsoever. No, there will be no father, son. There will be no mother, daughter. There will be no, you know, uh, son and fathers, you know, daughter and mother. There will be no aunts and uncles, no best friends, no besties. There's not going to be any of that. Allah says in another ayah, فَإِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَلَا أَنْسَابَ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَلَا يَتَسَاءَلُونَ That when the trumpet is blown and they are resurrected, there will be no ansab, there will be no familial relationships, there will be no lineage, there will be no biological connections. There will be no biological connections. Alright? Yawma idhin and la yatasa'anun nor will anybody ask about anybody else. Nobody will be concerned. Today, we are so concerned with what everybody else is doing. Let me go look at this person's Facebook page. Let me see what he's doing. Let me go look at this person's Instagram page. Let me see what she's doing. Let me see what that person is doing. Everybody is worried about what somebody else is doing today. On the day of judgment, Allah says, 
that when the trumpet is blown, there will be no biological, familial relationships between them, nor will anybody ask about anybody else. You won't even be concerned. I don't care. So why wait? until the day of judgment comes around to only be concerned about yourself when you can actually do that right now. You can actually be completely concerned about you and only you right now. Here again, putting the focus on yourself. We're so worried about what somebody else is doing. You know why we worry so much about what somebody else is doing? Because we judge our progress we judge our progress off of somebody else's failure. So we're constantly looking to see if somebody else has fallen on, them, on their face, if someone else has made a mistake, if someone else has committed a sin, if somebody else has fallen from grace. Because then we can determine, I'm not that bad. I'm actually good. We determine how good we are by how bad someone else is doing. That is a sad, sick state that we have reduced ourselves to. Your gauge of how good you are is based upon how bad somebody else is doing. That is a sad thing, man. And we'll say, well, you know, I'm not doing as bad as this person. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. MashaAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there will be no family connections, no biological connections on that day, nor will anybody ask about anybody else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then going back to Surah Al-Zumar, he said, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا وَوُضِيَ الْكِتَابُ وَجِيءَ بِالنَّبِيِّينَ وَالشُّهَدَا وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and then the earth will shine with the light of its Lord. And the book, the records, will be laid out in front. And the prophets will be brought, and the witnesses will be brought, وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ And they will be judged in truth. وَهُمْ لَا يُذْلَمُونَ And they will not be oppressed. Now we move to... Judgment. We move on now. Once everyone is, the trumpet has been blown, everyone has been resurrected, brought back to life, everyone is standing next to one another, you know, naked, uncircumcised, worried, in fear, traumatized, worried, anxious, right? And now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the earth to shine with the light of its Lord. And then the books will be laid out in front of us. The book of deeds, this should scare every single one of us. The first thing that we have to understand is that from the time we exited the womb of our mothers, there were two angels that were appointed to us to write down everything we do and everything that we say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ يَتَلَقَّى مُتَلَقِّيَانِ عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَعَنِ الشِّمَالِ قَعِيدٍ ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد. And consider the angel on your right and on your left. عن اليمين وعن الشمال قائد. Consider the angel that is on your right and on your left قائد, sitting, waiting. ما يلفظ من قول. Not a word comes out of your mouth except that they write it down. That means that as a human being, you are the author of your own book. You are the author of your own book. And just like any author, you have to own your words. You understand? You are the author of your own book. Everything that is in your record of deeds, you wrote. You dictated to the angels, and the angels wrote it down. Whatever you did, whatever you said, all they did was write it down. So essentially, you were the author of your own book, and just like any author, you have to own your words. 
the record of deeds will be laid out. The book of deeds will be laid out in front of every individual. And you will remember every single thing that you did on that day. Right? When you go to court and they say, oh, you got a few charges here. Wallahi, every single charge you know. You don't ever have to say, well, what did I do? I don't know what I did. Oh, I know I did this. I know, I know that's probably on there. I know that's probably there. You already know. You already know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَوْمَ إِذِي يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ وَأَنَّا لَهُ ذِكْرًا Surah Al-Fajr. Allah says, on the day when man will remember everything he did. يَوْمَ إِذِي يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ On the day when every human being will remember what they did. وَأَنَّ لَهُ ذِكْرًا But how will that remembrance at this time be of any benefit to you? We commit so many sins, we forget how many sins we commit. The angels don't miss anything. Trust me. They don't miss anything. The day, the time, where you were, the moment you said it, how you said it, all of it is recorded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will record, will have the angels record everything. Not because Allah forgets or Allah doesn't know what you did, but your record is a proof against you. <laughs> your book is a proof against you. You wrote it. It's like someone says to you, is this not your handwriting? And you say, yeah, you can't deny it. It is your handwriting. You wrote it. It's your book. You wrote it. Isn't this your handwriting? Yes. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, on the day when we will lay your book out in front of you, on the day when we will lay your book out in front of you, and Allah will say, Iqra kitabaka. Read your book. Today you are a proof against your own self. Read your book. Did the angels wrong you in anything? Did the angels write down something? Is there something in there that you didn't do? Something in there that you didn't say? Let me know. The angels record with precision. They don't miss anything. With precision. And we might think that that's a joke. We think it's a joke now because we sit from a place of privilege. The reality of the world in front of us has yet to expose itself to us. Allah says in another ayah in the Quran, وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابِ فَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ وَيَكُونُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا Allah says, and the book will be laid out. The book will be laid out. Pay attention. The book has been laid out. And you will find those who did evil deeds, those who did criminal acts in fear of what's in that book. Scared to death of what's in that book. I don't even want to open it because I already know what's in there. Allah already said that on the day when the human being will remember everything that he did, but that, bit of that reminder will benefit him nothing at this moment. It will benefit you nothing to remember on that day what you did today. But the book will be laid out. And you will see those who did evil deeds, afraid, terrified of what's in it. And then when they open the book and look at it, they will say, Oh, woe is me. Shame on me. Shame on me. What is with this book? What is with this book? 
لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحصاها. It has not left out anything minuscule, has not left out anything minute, and has not let anything out significant. إلا أحصاها except that it's all recorded therein. Everything. The things that I did in secret when nobody was around and I thought nobody saw me and the angels were there writing down. As a matter of fact, there's a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, he told us to have mercy on the recording angels. Think about that. There's a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, said, have mercy. Ihtarimu kiram al katibin. Akrimu kiram al katibin. Honor the noble scribes, the angels that write down everything you do. Honor them by not allowing them to see you engaged in sin and have to write it down. <laughs> Honor your recording angels by allowing them to only write what is good. If you don't take anything else away from this lecture, that should be sufficient. Honor the recording angels by not allowing them to write down anything that is going to come back and haunt you later on. It's painful for the angels to write that down. It's like when you work at like a courthouse or you work at and you just, you, you know, you're looking at the person's, you know, indictment. You're looking at the person's paperwork and you're looking at the person in front of you and you're saying to yourself, like, dude, you're going to jail for a long time. And the person is like, no, nah, I'm going to beat this. I'm taking it to trial. You know, they don't have nothing against me. And you're looking at the indictment and you're like, they don't have anything against you. Like, dude, you don't see all these papers? They got a 28-page indictment on you. <laughs> they got informants. People snitched on you. They got all of it right here. And you're still talking about, well, I'm taking it to court. I'm not, I'm not, going, I'm not going to plead guilty. I'm not, they're going to have to try me. It's like they don't need to try you. You're guilty already. This is the angels as they're writing down what you're doing, the haram that you're committing, the things that you are doing wrong, and the angels know the punishment that is waiting for you on the other side. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Akrimu kiram al katibin, honor the noble scribes by letting them only write down the good things that you do. So he will say, يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا What is with this book? The precision of this book, it has not left out anything big or small, except that it recorded it. وَوَجِدُ مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا And every human being will see what he or she did present in their book. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا And your Lord will not oppress anyone. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold you accountable if there is anything in your book that you didn't do. Allah is not going to hold you accountable for it. And if there's anything in your book that is missing, that you did, of good deeds that the angels didn't record, which we know there's not, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make sure that you get everything that you deserve. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوُذِيَ الْكِتَابِ وَجِيَ بِالنَّبِيِّينَ وَالشُّهَدَى Here's another factor that we need to consider. That the prophets will be brought and the shuhada, the witnesses. The prophets will be brought forth as witnesses over their respective nations. Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ and on the day when we will call every nation of people to stand behind their imam. And there's some people, unfortunately, who say they are Muslim, who believe that they are going to be standing behind their imam. I will be standing behind my imam, bi-idhnillah, and that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our imam is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's not another Muhammad. There's no other Muhammad that you want to be standing behind on the day of judgment other than Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Trust me, there's no other Muhammad. 
We say, oh, my imam this and my imam that. And we put so much emphasis, this ta'asum, this blind following, this, you know, this um, uh, fanaticism with imams and, you know, this imam and, you know, my sheikh and my imam. My imam is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُلَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On the day when we will call every nation to stand behind their imam. And the Prophet ﷺ will be witnesses over our ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned the ayat in the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ one day he said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, says Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. Show you how much the Qur'an had an impact on the Prophet ﷺ, who was a man who lived the Qur'an. He was the Qur'an walking. Aisha said, كَانَ خُرْقُهُ Quran." His behavior was the Qur'an. And yet he was still affected by the Qur'an. You have some people who read the Qur'an and believe, okay, khalas, I read the whole Qur'an, or I memorized the whole Qur'an, I never have to revisit it again. The Prophet وسلم, he said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Iqra alayya al-Qur'an. Read the Qur'an to me. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, Aqra alayka al-Qur'an wa alayka unzil. Am I going to read the Qur'an to you when the Qur'an was actually revealed to you? You were the one that the Qur'an was revealed to? The Prophet وسلم, said to him, Inni uhibbu an asma'ahu min ghayri. I like to hear other people other than myself recite the Qur'an. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud began to recite the Qur'an. He's reciting Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ. He just loves to hear the Qur'an recited. Not that he's doing the, rec the recitation, but he loves to hear other people reciting it. This is actually one of the signs that you love Allah. One of the signs that you love Allah is that you love his speech. You love his book. That when you love somebody, you want to hear their voice. You want to hear them talk all the time. Right? We say, I wish I could just hear your voice one more time. That is a sign that you love someone. If you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you love to hear his book recited. The Prophet said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Iqra alayhi al-Qur'an. Read the Qur'an to me. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, I'm not going to read the Qur'an to you and the Qur'an was revealed to you. The Prophet said, I love to hear it recited by other people. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, so I begin to recite Surah Ali Imran. And then I started to recite Surah Al-Nisa. He said, and then I came to an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ and how will it be on the day of judgment when we produce or we bring forth for every nation a witness and we bring you, O Muhammad, as a witness? The Prophet ﷺ, he said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, enough, enough, don't recite anymore, I don't want to hear anymore, enough. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, When I looked at the Prophet ﷺ's face, his eyes had tears in them. He was crying because this ayat is an honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bring the Prophet sallallahu as a witness against his entire ummah. Subhanallah. I'm trying to stop myself from crying. Subhanallah. The honor that Allah will give him in making him a witness against his nation. <laughs> and the honor in Allah making the Prophet ﷺ a witness against his nation is that the unfortunate thing is that some of us as Muslims are not going to make it. That's the bottom line. <laughs> some of us are not going to make it. As we go across the bridge over the hellfire, the prophets will be rooting us on, saying, Rabbi, Sallam, Sallam, O oh Allah, give them safety as they go across the bridge over the hellfire. Ibn Qayyim said, بِقَدْرِ إِسْتِقَامَتِكَ عَلَى السِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ فِي الدُّنْيَا يَقُونُ إِسْتِقَامَتِكَ عَلَى السِّرَاطِ فَوْقَ جَهَنَّمِ Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, 
He said, based upon your steadfastness, based upon your steadfastness on the straight path in this life will determine how fast you go across the bridge over the hellfire in the next life. So if you were slow in obeying a law, you obeyed a law when you wanted to. I'll give up my girlfriend when I'm ready. I'll give up, you know, wearing gold when I'm done, right? You still got Muslims out here who wear gold, right? I'm seeing on Instagram and on other places and you're like, you know, like, and I mean like grown men. We're not talking about teenagers. Like you get teenagers, you know, they, they you know, they're, you know, they see this as a fad and they want to be a part of it. When you're talking about 40 year old men still wearing big gold chains around their neck, it looks ridiculous, man. You look foolish. You look foolish. Walking around with watches with diamonds in them and, you know, you know, doing it for the gram. You look foolish. And then on top of that, you're a Muslim and you're wearing gold. Nonetheless, if you were slow in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life, then you will be slow going across the bridge over the hellfire in the next life. So based upon how quick you were to respond to Allah in this life will determine how quickly you go across the bridge over the hellfire. The Prophet wasallam. some Muslims will be snatched off the bridge. Some people will go across the bridge over the hellfire like a bolt of lightning. Some will go across like the blinking of an eye, the time that it takes to blink your eye, across the bridge. Thousands of years going up, thousands of years going across, thousands of years going down, and you across the bridge like the blinking of an eye. Allahu Akbar. That means that when you found that something was haram, you immediately considered it haram. When you found something was halal, you immediately acted upon it. You found that the, you, you, was, you accepted it as halal. When you found something was sunnah, you immediately practiced it because you realized that it was sunnah. When you found something was bid'ah, innovation, you stayed away from it because you knew that it was against Islam. Immediately, you will go across the bridge thousands of years. In distance, you will go across like the blinking of an eye. Some people. Allahu alam. It's the bridge that is over the hellfire. What it is connected to, Allahu alam. People will leave the earth to go to the the qiyamah is going to be in the world. No, the world, the piyama is not going to be on the world. It'll be a different plane, a different plateau, and a different world, a different dimension. Not this world that we live in. A flat plane that will accommodate everyone that Allah created from the first man to the last man. And everything is possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing that, that would render that impossible. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same one who created the entire earth and everything that is in it with one word. B. <laughs> created the same human being with all of his faculties, with all of our, you're a physician, so you know the human anatomy and how it works. Kun fayakun. Inna mathada Isa, inna Allahi ka mathadi Adam, khalaqahu min tarabin, thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. That the example of Jesus before God is like the example of Adam. He created him from dirt and then he said to him, be. And he was. Just one word. We can't create anything in this entire world with one word. Nothing. <laughs> and you have people walking around talking about their God. <laughs> right? God. What's up, God? God body, right? And I respect, you know, I respect your hustle. I respect the fact that you're trying to, you know, find some level of consciousness. You're trying to find some frequency of higher elevation. I get it. Trust me. I understand. But at the same token, God, you know, is, an exagger is a gross exaggeration. God created everything that you see with one word. Be. <laughs> Just a word. We can't create anything with a word. Nothing. In order for Siri to respond to us, we got to give her an entire sentence. <laughs> you understand? God created everything with one word. Created the human being with one word. So, there's some people who are going to go across the bridge like a bolt of lightning, some like a blinking of an eye. 
some like a fast riding animal. And there's some people, there's a person that the Prophet ﷺ described that will go across the bridge over the hellfire, crawling on his stomach. And then he will turn to Allah and he will say, لِمَاذَا أَبْطَعْتَنِي Why did you make me go across the bridge so slow? Here again, blaming God for his failures. Why did you make me go across the bridge so slow? And Allah will say to the individual, مَا أَبْطَعْتُكَ لَكِنْ أَبْطَعَكَ أَمِلُكَ I didn't make you go across the bridge slow. Your deeds made you go across the bridge slow. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, مَنْ أَبْطَعَهُ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْهُ نَسَبُهُ Whoever's deeds are holding him back, his connection to... Allah doesn't care that you're an Arab. Allah doesn't care that you're a descendant of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That means absolutely nothing. Nothing. So, some Muslims are not going to make it. It's unfortunate. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are not from amongst those. No, Muslims. Muslims. Those who died on La ilaha illallah, yes. Absolutely. So the Prophet sallallahu will try to intercede for some Muslims. The Prophet sallallahu said in an authentic hadith, Inni furatukum al hawd. I will be the first of you, of my ummah, of my community, at the hold, at this huge basin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that we supplicate for. Ati Muhammadin al-Fasi'ah al-Wasila wal-Fadila. Oh Allah, give Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Wasila wal-Fadila. Give him that place that you promised him. Alright? He said, I will be the first of my ummah at this hold, this drinking place. Right? He said, "Man marra aliya shariba, wa man shariba lam yadma, lam yadma abadan." He said, "Whoever passes by this hold, this basin where water is, they could take a sip from it, and they will never, ever be thirsty ever again." Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine taking a drink from the well given to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you are never thirsty ever again? He said, وَلَا يَرُدَّنَّ عَلَيَّ أَقْوَامٌ أَعْرِفُهُمْ وَيَعْرِفُونَنِي He said, and then a group of people from my ummah, Muslims, will be presented to me. For those of you who don't pray, for those of you who struggle with praying, for those of you who struggle with fasting, for those of you who struggle with maintaining your chastity, I need you guys to listen very closely. This is not a game, it is not a joke. This is not a joke, man. We think that not praying, inshallah, I'll make it up. I'll do some huge, magnificent deed somewhere along the line in my life. And Allah will just forgive me for what I did. We're hoping, praying that there's one thing that I'm going to do in my life that I'm going to be forgiven for. But there's no guarantee. Making hajj, sinning, and then turning around and make hajj does not mean that that sin was erased. We live between fear and hope. I said that at the very beginning of the lecture. We live between fear and hope. And there's no guarantee that because you, can, you, you have some Muslims who sin, right? And then they go and make hajj. And think, okay, I made hajj. I'm forgiven for all of those sins. That's it. What guarantees do you have? You have hope. That's all you have. You have hope. That's it. And if you're banking on hope, you're sadly mistaken. If you are banking on hope, you are sadly mistaken. Tie your camel. <laughs> Tie your camel. How can you prepare for that day? We're talking about it right now. We'll get to it. So the Prophet Wasallam, he said... فَلَا يُرُدَّنَّ عَلَيَّ أَقْوَامٌ أَعْرِفُهُمْ وَيَعْرِفُونَنِي He said, a group from my ummah will be presented to me. I know them and they know me. I know them and they know me. They're from my ummah. He said, ثُمَّ يُحَالُوا يُحَالُوا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَهُمْ He said, then a partition will be placed in between me and them. فَأَقُولُ إِنَّهُمْ مِنِّي إِنَّهُمْ أُمَّتِي 
The Prophet Sallallahu will yell out to Allah, My Ummah, my Ummah, they are part of my community, oh Allah. They are part of my community. The Prophet knows what's getting ready to happen to them. Understand, the Prophet Sallallahu knows what is getting ready to happen to them. Then I will be separated from them. And the Prophet will call out to Allah, Ummati, Ummati. Oh Allah, they are part of my community. They're part of my nation, part of my community. You promised that you would let all of my community go into Jannah. They're part of my community. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّكَ لَا تَدْرِي مَا أَحْدَثُوا بَعْدَكَ you don't know what they innovated and what they introduced into your religion after you. You don't know what they did after you. They introduced things into your religion that was not a part of it. You don't know what they did after you. And the Prophet wasallam, realizing the infraction, he will say, Suhqan, suhqan liman badi. Away, take them away, take them away. Away with those who change my religion after me. Away with them. Take them away. This points to the danger of innovation, of introducing new things into the religion that is not a part of it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuing with Surah to Zumar. He said, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبواب وفتح فتحت أبوابها وقاف قال لهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يأتون يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين الله says and now the disbelievers Non-believers. وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And then those who disbelieve will be ushered into hell, Zumara, in a group. That's the name of the surah. Surah is called Zumar. Zumar means in a group. If you've ever seen a chain gang, right? you ever seen prisoners, right? They're all shackled and there's one chain that connects all of them together. And they're all being ushered by the police or by those individuals uh, they call um, correction officers, ushered into a particular area. All right? Think about that scene and think about how these individuals who chose to disbelieve in God, chose to believe but not follow, <laughs> you have some people who believe in God But still choose to do them To live their life according to their terms You are no different than someone who actually disbelieves in God Because if you believe in God Then you follow Him You worship Him You serve Him You dedicate your life to Him You don't say, oh I believe in God But still choose to do you Then you are no different than someone who says I don't believe in God There's no difference between the two no difference. But Allah says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا And those who disbelieve will be ushered to hell, Zumara, in a group. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُهَا Until they reach the gates of hell, وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا And the gates of hell will be opened for them. فَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا And the gatekeeper of the hellfire, Malik, will say to them, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ رُسُلٌ مِّنْكُمْ This is kind of like rubbing it in their face. Didn't a messenger come to you, reciting to you the verses of your Lord, and warning you about this day right here? Didn't a warner come to you? Didn't a messenger come to you? And they will say, قَالُوا بَلَى They will say, of course, yes he did. Then the angel will say, قَالُوا بَلَى وَلَكِنْ حَقَّتْ عَلَيْهِ كَلِمَةُ الْعَذَابِ The angels will say, well then the punishment is justified against you. The punishment is justified against you. وَقِيلَ دَخُلُوا أَبَوَابَ جَهَنَّمِ And it will be said to them, enter into the gates of hell, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا To dwell therein for eternity, never to come out. And for those of you who say, well, I, that's, that's, that's a farce. 
I don't believe in that. You're free to believe in whatever you want to believe in. But guess what? Believing there is a such thing as heaven and hell, and that there's a God that put us here for a purpose, believing in all of that is far easier and safer than not believing in it. Than to believe that hellfire is nonsense, paradise is nonsense, this whole belief in this concept of a higher being, a higher power, is all nonsense. You stand more to lose not believing <laughs> then you do believing. Believing in it is not going to cost you anything. It doesn't cost you anything to believe in God. Minor sacrifices here and there doesn't really cost you a thing. I converted to Islam 20 years ago. I've made some adjustments to you know some aspects of my life, but the essence of who I am never changed. I'm still who I am. Believing in God hasn't changed the essence of who I am. I didn't lose anything because I believed in God. But not believing in God, you stand a chance of losing everything. That's a gamble that I don't think anybody can afford to take. Gamble that most people can't afford. Because let's just say hypothetically, for your argument's sake, that it is true. <laughs> let's just say it is true. You know, nonetheless, the angels will say, then no messenger come to you, a warner come to you to warn you about this day right here. And they will say, yes, yeah, you know, but the punishment has been justified against those who disbelieve. God gave you 70 years. God gave you a hundred years. You live to a whole hundred years. <laughs> We have grandparents that are in their 90s and you still refuse to worship God. You still refuse to worship God alone. You're still worshiping Jesus at 90 years old. Still devoting all of your worship and your you know, spirituality, you know, f you know, being filtered through a human being. At the end of the day, a human being. And we'll say, well, Jesus is the son of God. Right, okay. Well, the Bible also said that David was the son of God. Prophet David was the son of God, too. Right? Not only that, Jesus said he was the son of man. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. He was the son of man. So you're still going to run with the whole narrative that Jesus is the son of God, and I'm, I'm worshiping Jesus, and I'm going through God. Don't you realize that that is idolatry? God doesn't want you to go through anybody to get to him. God created you himself. And your salvation is through him, not through any other human being. And the only thing that Jesus wanted you to do is follow him into the truth. That's it. Nonetheless, we become fanatic. We become fanatic about personality of Jesus, got Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus or whatever, the thing is, is that we do believe in Jesus. <laughs> we don't worship him, but we do believe in him. You couldn't be a Muslim without believing in him. But believing in Jesus does not mandate or necessitate serving him and worshiping him. You understand? I worship none other than God Almighty. Jesus is only a means to the end and not the end. Following him and respecting him. Following his example. And the sad thing about it is that the same people who yell at the top of their lungs, got Jesus, believe in Jesus Christ, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. A lot of the people, most of the people who say that are not even true followers of Jesus himself. Look at the way Jesus prayed in the Bible and look at the way that you pray. Jesus never bent over on the side of a tub in the bathroom and prayed to God. Jesus betook himself to the mountain and he fell prostrate on his head. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Nonetheless, there's always an excuse. I have to live my life. I don't believe in God. And all of the other theories that have not benefited them anything. The gates of hell are seven. And each one has an appropriate punishment for those that are put into it. Not all those who go to hell are going to the same level of hell. There are some, there are some that deserve a deeper level of hell than others. Allah says in the Quran, 
Indeed, hell is the final destination for all of them that disbelieve in him. It has seven gates. And every gate, every level of hell has a particular level of punishment that is appropriate for those who enter it. Right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in Surah Al-Naba, He said, They will not taste in hell anything cold, nor will they have anything to drink. إِلَّا حَمِيمًا وَغَسَّاقًا Except Hamim, they will have hot scorching water, غَسَّاقًا That will be the pus from the wounds of the people being punished. That will be your drink. جَزَاءَ وِفَاقًا An appropriate punishment. An appropriate punishment. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يَرْجُونَ حِسَابًا They did, they had no concept of reckoning. They had no concept that they were going to be held accountable, that they were going to, there was going to come a day of reckoning. And they belied and denied and came up with all types of excuses for why God doesn't exist and why they don't have to follow God, why they don't have to listen to this and why they don't have to do that. And everything we have recorded in a book. So taste the punishment. لَنَّزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا So taste therein the punishment. We will only increase you in punishment and nothing else. It's a time for Maghrib. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here. And we'll continue this lecture because the best part of it all is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin to talk about those who believe. Those who believe in how they will be ushered into paradise. All right, this is this is probably the you know the crux of it. Um, can we? Can you give me about ten minutes? Can we do ten minutes? All right. So then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He said, "Wasiqa al-ladina taqoo Rabbahum ila al-jannati zumara." And then those who feared or were conscious of Allah, Allah used the word taqwa, right? He didn't say the believers. He said those who were conscious of God will be ushered to paradise, Zumara, in a group. Hatta ida jauha, when they come to the gates of paradise, wafutihat abu abuha, and the gates of paradise are open. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا And the gatekeeper of paradise, Ridwan, will welcome us at the gate. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ The angel will greet you at the gate of paradise by saying, Peace be upon you. Every time we greet one another with the salam, we should think about the angel greeting us at the gate of paradise with the same greeting. The next time you refuse to give a Muslim salam, think about the angel refusing to give you salam at the gate of Jannah. That when they come to the gate of Jannah, khazanatuha, and the gatekeeper of Jannah, who the Prophet ﷺ told us was an angel by the name of Ridwan, will say to them, Salamun alaykum, peace be upon you. Now we truly experience peace. All the pain, all of the trauma, all of the anxiety, all of the fear, all of the worry, all of the drama, all of the pain that we experience in this life will mean absolutely nothing at that moment. The words coming out of the mouth of that angel, Salamun alaikum, peace be upon you, will be the, the most precious words that we have ever heard. You ever been in fear of something? You ever had to go on a run and have someone, you go to someone's house and they say, you know, and they embrace you. They say, come on, you're safe now. You can come into my house. No more worries. You're good now. That feeling of security, that feeling of peace, that no more harm is going to come to me. Right? SubhanAllah, man. My mother, man, my mother used to say to me, I relax the most when you are in jail. Because I know when you are in jail, no one, no harm is coming to you. 
I know you're not dead on the streets. I know I'm not going to get a phone call. It's sad. It's a sad thing to say for an African-American mother to say to her child, I feel most comfortable with you when you are in jail because I don't have to worry about a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning with someone telling me that they found you shot somewhere or dead somewhere. This is the type of environment that we live in where a mother feels at ease, feels peace when her child is in jail. Subhanallah, man. Wow. So the angels will greet them at the gates of Jannah. Salamun alaykum. Peace be upon you. True peace is on you now. Because as we enter into Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah that no harm will come to us. La yamassuhum fiha nasabun. No anxiety, no fear will come to them, nor will anybody ask them to leave. You will never be asked to leave. You're in Jannah. Enjoy it for eternity. No one will ask you to leave. Then the angel will say, Salamu alaykum, tibitum. You did good. You did good. Good job. These are words that an angel will greet you with at the gate of paradise. Peace be upon you. You did a good job, man. Enter into Jannah, enter into paradise to dwell therein forever. You never have to worry about any more pain. Never have to worry about somebody asking you to leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a glimpse into the situation of those who made small sacrifices in this life in order to reap the eternal benefit of the hereafter. What do we sacrifice for Jannah? What do we sacrifice? Right? Very small. Right? Seven minutes to pray. Seven times five, 35 minutes in a 24-hour span. 24 hours in a day. And all you lost out of 24 hours was 35 minutes. 35 minutes. And you have some Muslims, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them, and may Allah never test us, never test us with not making salah. But you have many Muslims who do not pray today because 35 minutes within a 24-hour span is entirely too much time to give to God for his paradise. Too much. I'm too busy. I got other things that I need to do. And the sad thing about that, a brother just reminded me of something today. He said he was listening to a lecture some years ago. And the person said, the danger with not praying, for those of you who struggle with salah, I want you to think about this. For those of us who don't pray or struggle with praying, right? Think about this. When Muslims are in the hellfire, Muslims are in hell, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Allah to intercede on behalf of those Muslims who are in hell. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, go and grab from every hundred people, every thousand people in hell, grab one from your ummah. One out of every thousand, go grab him. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets to the hellfire, Right? When the prophet gets to the hellfire, how is he going to recognize the believers? <laughs> how is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam going to recognize the believers in the hellfire? Through their prostration marks. <laughs> prostration marks. The hellfire will not be able to burn up the places of prostration. That's how the prophet will recognize the people from your forehead your knuckles, your knees, your feet, you will, uh, the Prophet will be able to recognize you by your prostration marks. So what about the Muslim who doesn't pray? And the Prophet Wasallam is sent to hell to go grab out of every thousand in hell, grab one from your ummah. But the Prophet can't recognize you because you don't have any prostration marks. There are no marks and I'm not saying that you got to go pray now and rub your head on the ground so you can get a prostration mark. Because that, that doesn't really mean anything anyway. Because you can have a deep prostration mark on your forehead 
and render your salat null and void by believing or doing things that are, you know, contradictory to Islam. So it doesn't really matter. But how is the Prophet going to recognize you in hell when you never even prayed? <laughs> so he's going to grab one out of every thousand. He may overlook you, may forget about you, may overlook you because he doesn't even recognize you from the places of your prostration, man. SubhanAllah. But a small sacrifice that we made in this life for a huge reward in the hereafter. And after the pass over the bridge, over the hellfire, they will go to the gates of Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said, and the, oh, men bab al -jannah. the Prophet ﷺ said, I will be the first one to knock on the gates of paradise, to open the gate for my ummah. He said, bab al yawm al fa He said, I will come to the gates of paradise on the day of judgment, on that day. And I will knock on the gate of Jannah for them to open the gates. For Yakulu Khazim Menenta. And the gatekeeper of Jannah will say, Who are you? And the Prophet said, For Akulu Muhammad. <laughs> SubhanAllah. He said, I will say, It's Muhammad. Right? Kala Yakulu Bel Umirtu and La Eftah Li Ahadin Kablak. He said, I, the angel will say, I know who you are because I have not been ordered to open the gate of paradise for anyone before you. The gates are open for you. This is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whom we follow, whom we love more than we love our own selves. More than we love our own selves. SubhanAllah. The honor that Allah has given him. This is why he cried. This is why he felt, you know, so humbled. Because he's, you know, why did Allah favor me like this? Out of all of the people that Allah chose to be prophets and messengers, why did Allah choose me? Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever look at your life and say to yourself, why did Allah choose me? What did I do to deserve this? And that thought should humble you. That thought alone should make you humble because Allah did not have to choose you. Allah could have chosen someone else. But He chose you. And you're steady asking yourself, why? What did I do? I don't even deserve what Allah gave me. But this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He conveys to whomever from amongst His servants that He wants. So the honor that Allah gave the Prophet sallallahu for the sacrifices that He made not just for our ummah, but for the entire world. Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, made sacrifices that the world today continues to benefit from. While Muslims, while the religion of Islam are now, you know, are under this microscope and are, you know, as being, you know, labeled as, you know, the world's biggest problem is Islam and Muslims. Yet we have societies who are still benefiting, reaping the benefits of the sacrifices that this man made for people who were not even followers of his. Didn't even believe in him. And this is the most, the greatest and most prominent humanitarian the world has ever seen. Allah said that we have sent him rahmatan lil alameen as a mercy for mankind as a whole. Not just for Muslims, a mercy for mankind. And the angels will open the gates with the warmest welcome that denotes glad tidings and praise and peace unlike we have never heard in this life. The angels say to you, Tibetun, you did a good job. Some of us don't even get a pat on the back in this life. We do, we work so hard, work so diligently, even in this life, and we never have someone to just say, you know what, you're doing a good job. The ultimate validation is for the angels to say, Salamu alaykum, tibitum, peace be upon you, you did a great job. You did a good job. The ultimate validation. And um, inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين We don't necessarily have time for um, questions and answers so we'll skip that for today and we'll save that for another time بإذن الله 
Wa jazakum Allahu khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.